Indeed, he is worthy. Thank you, Jordan and worship team, for impressing those truths upon our heart this morning. A common objection to the claims of Christianity is that if Jesus really was a God, why didn't he ever say it? That question ultimately doesn't deal fairly with the evidence of Scripture. Jesus used the institutions and the rich imagery associated with God in the Jewish culture to claim that he was indeed the creator God and the God of Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, Moses, and David. And today we come to a passage where Jesus' manner of claiming to be God forms a climactic moment in his ministry as the opposition increases. If I could ask you to put yourself in the culture of the Jewish nation for just a moment with the expectation of a coming Messiah, if you were to reveal yourself as God, consider these kinds of questions. Where would you go in the nation of Israel to declare it? Second question, when would you go to that place? And third question, what exactly would you claim? So let's think about the first question. Where would you go in the nation of Israel at that moment in time? The institution that was most associated with God in, the, in that time was the Jewish temple. Jesus most likely would uh, unveil himself there in the temple. Question number two, where would you go, or excuse me, when would you go to that temple? The answer is you would go to the temple at one of its feasts where all of Israel was gathered. And not just any feast, but one of the most joyous feasts that celebrated God's leading of the people because the Messiah was coming to lead the people. That most joyous feast was called the Feast of Tabernacles or the Feast of Booths. Pastor Green mentioned that to us last week. It was a celebration involving God's people building little tents or booths all around Jerusalem and in the countryside, living in them as they commemorated living in their tents or shelters as God led Israel through the wilderness in 1400 BC. In fact, that holiday is still celebrated today where they build booths, apparently from Ikea or something like that. But um, <laughs> so during Jesus's day, that celebration included a practice known as the illumination of the temple. And in that, a massive oil-filled lamp was lit, which illuminated the night sky all around Jerusalem during the celebration. There was more to this light, however. The longing of the Jewish people was that the light of God, the glory of God, someday would return to that Jewish temple. Six, <coughs> 600 years earlier, the light of the temple, God's presence had actually departed from God's people because of their perpetual sin. In a passage like this, Ezekiel says, but as for those whose hearts go after their detestable things and abomination, I will bring their conduct down on their heads, declares the Lord God. And then the cherubim lifted up their wings. The glory of God riding on the wings of the cherubim hovered over them and the glory of the Lord departed from the midst of the city and stood over the mountains and then went to the east of the city. There's more about this glorious light, however. The light that had taken up residence in the temple, precisely the glory of the Lord, was the same light of God that led God's people through the wilderness. In a passage like this, Exodus 40, then the cloud covered the tent of meeting, meeting and the glory of the Lord filled the tabernacle. Moses was not able to enter the tent because the cloud had settled on it and the glory of the Lord filled the tabernacle. And throughout all of their journeys, whenever the cloud was taken up from the tabernacle, the sons of Israel would set out. For through all of their journeys, the cloud of the Lord was on the taper, tabernacle by day and there was fire in it by night in the sight of all of Israel, in the sight of all of Israel. So let's review. Question number one, if Jesus was going to claim to be God, where would he go? Answer, to the temple. Question number two, if Jesus was going to claim to be God, when would he go? Well, he would be at the Feast of Tabernacles where the light would illuminate the city and remind people of the glory of God and the hope 
of the light returning someday. Question number three, finally, if Jesus was going to claim to be God, he would go to the temple at the time of the Feast of Tabernacles where they longed for the glory of God to return. But what would he claim? What would he claim? The implication, the practical, obvious answer is, I am the light of the world. And he did. And everybody would know exactly what he's claiming as he stood there in the temple. Notice again the introduction to the book of John here. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. In him was life, and the life was the light of men. The light shines in the darkness. Fascinating, the darkness doesn't comprehend it. There was the true light, which coming into the world enlightens every man. He was in the world, and the world was made through him, and the world did not know him. That word became flesh and dwelt or tabernacled among us. And we saw his glory, glory as the only um, as the only one from the Father. Apparently, I didn't put the rest of that on the little slide there. Now, there's some amazing statements in that passage about Jesus as the light. But what is also amazing is about how, how, how is it possible that the blinding, glorious light like a sun is right in front of you, but you cannot see it? There's only one explanation for that. If there's a blind, if there is a glorious light in front of you, but you cannot see it, what's the only explanation for that? What are you? You're blind. And in chapter 9 of John, guess what? A blind man comes on the scene. Jesus heals him. But we're not there in John chapter 9 yet. This week in chapter 8, we see what causes an individual to be blind to the light of the world. So if you will, please turn in your Bibles to John chapter 8. That's on page 78 in the back section of the Bible in the chair in front of you. Our series this year through the Gospel of John is entitled Enjoying Life in His Name. And today we see one of the manifestations of the dark human heart that causes us to miss out on life in His name. We are speaking today about enjoying life in His name by repenting of self-righteousness. I'm going to set up the text for you here by reading John 7, 2 and, so, and John 7, 14. Then you can join me reading along in John chapter 8, verse 1. So John 7, 2. Now the feast of the Jews, the feast of booze, which I just explained, was near. Verse 14. But when it was now in the midst of the feast, Jesus went up to the temple. And there he taught, and everybody was amazed at his teaching. Chapter 8, verse 1. Jesus went to the Mount of Olives. Early in the morning, he came again to the temple. Verse 3, the scribes and the Pharisees brought a woman caught in adultery and having set her in the center of the court. Can you imagine that? All of the people around and me bringing some lady caught in adultery, setting them right in front of everybody. Verse 4, They said to him, teacher, this woman has been caught in adultery in the very act. Now the law of Moses commanded us to stone such women. What do you say? You know, the Pharisee statement about adultery is correct. You can read about the penalty for adultery. If you want to mark a reference here, Deuteronomy 22, 22. But then as Countless Bible students have observed this action by the Pharisees is outrageous. Let me ask you, how many people does it take to commit adultery? Let's just figure that out. Is it rocket science? How many people does it take? Two. And they even said she was caught in the act. The Pharisees were violating the law themselves that they that commanded them not to be partial, which is in Deuteronomy chapter 1, verse 17. Verse 6, they were saying this, testing him, so that they might have grounds for accusing him. The Pharisees were not serious about righteousness. The self-righteous blind Pharisees were attempting to turn the crowds against the popular Jesus who, were, who was stealing their thunder by either forcing Jesus into a scenario where 
He would violate the word of God by saying, no, we don't need to stone her. Thus driving the crowds away from him by not holding the word of God or that Jesus would have to throw the woman under the bus and thus drive the sinners who were flocking to him away from him. But Jesus, next verse, stooped down and with his finger wrote on the ground. By the way, what did Jesus write on the ground? Nobody knows. Countless, countless scholars have spilled ink over this, but we don't know. The text has not told us. So speculation is probably not wise here. Verse seven, but when they persisted in asking him, he straightened up and said to them, he who is without sin among you, you be the first one to throw a stone at her. Jesus actually quotes Deuteronomy 17, six here. The law that the accuser of a sin that demanded the death penalty should be the first to pick up the stone. So Jesus ultimately masterfully holds to the law and exposes the Pharisees hypocrisy at the same time. Verse eight, again, he stooped down and wrote on the ground. And when they heard it, they began to go out one by one beginning with the older ones first. I wonder why the older ones went first. This is speculation here, but maybe they were caught up in some similar sins in their past. And he was left alone. Say the word alone. So nobody else with them. So there was the woman and him. She was in the center of the court. Straightening up, Jesus said to her, woman, where are they? Did no one condemn you? And she said, no one, Lord. And Jesus said, I don't condemn you either. Go and sin no more. Apparently she was an adulterous woman. Jesus knows that. And he says, do not sin anymore. Verse 12. Then probably at another time in the Feast of the Tabernacles, Jesus spoke again to them um, saying, I am the light of the world. He who follows me will not walk in the darkness, but will have the light of life. So the Pharisees, those in the darkness, denying the light of the world, said to him, you are testifying about yourself, but your testimony is not true. Let's skip to verse 19. So they were also saying to him, where is your father? The self-righteous Pharisees, believing that Jesus himself was conceived out of wedlock, yes, they go there to Jesus' theorized, illegitimate birth. If you're self-righteous, you have to find fault in another person. And Jesus answered, you don't know me nor my father. If you knew me, you would know my father. These words he spoke in the treasury as he taught in the temple. And no one seized him because his hour had not yet come. These amazing words about being the light of the world were startling. But what is more startling is they did not seize him right then and there and kill him. The light of the world, the Shekinah glory of God was right there that he acclaimed to be. But it was not yet time for him to die. That was coming later. Verse 21. Then he said again to them, I go away and you will seek me. Ultimately, you can't come because you're going to die in your sins. You will die in your sin and you cannot come where I am. Where, you, where I am going, you cannot come. Verse 24. Therefore, I say to you that you will die in your sins unless you believe that I am. You will die in your sin. Third time he says that. So they were saying to him, who are you? <laughs> and Jesus, you notice their darkness. Jesus said to them, what have I been saying to you from the very beginning? Verse 28, Jesus gives them a prediction of one more sign for the self-righteous. When you lift up the son of man, then you will know that I am he. And today we want to develop three blinding results of self-righteousness that will cause you to miss enjoying life in Jesus' name. And let me define self-righteousness right up front here for us. So self-righteousness is a manner of life where I believe that because of some kind of morality that I possess or I practice, could be religious or it could be the current cultural morality of the day, that I believe that I practice that, then I'm superior compared to somebody else who does not practice as me. Christians can be guilty of self-righteousness and it is ugly and it is blinding in our Christian walk. 
The conservative right can be guilty of self-righteousness, and it is ugly and it is blinding. The liberal left also can be guilty of self-righteousness. You say, how is that, Brent? Well, whatever is the current cultural morality of the moment, the Me Too movement, the LGBTQ plus movement, a particular view of systemic racism, if you don't hold to that, I'm better than you. And it's ugly and it's blinding. Everybody, say everybody. Everybody is guilty of self-righteousness in some way. And no matter what morality you believe you practice, when you go that extra step and say, therefore, I'm superior to you, you're on your way to blindness that is on display here in our text. And in that mist, Jesus says, I am the light of the world. Here are the three blinding results of self-righteousness. Number one, you're going to miss the mercy of Jesus Christ in your blindness. Let him who is without sin cast the first stone. It's probably, you know, next to John 3, 16 and some other famous verses. I mean, everybody knows that phrase. Um, let me say a word about these verses right here at the beginning of our passage. If you will, please look at chapter 7, verse 53. You'll notice that if you're using one of those Bibles in the chair in front of you, that there's a bracket by that, and the end bracket goes to verse 11 in chapter 8. In most of your Bibles, you probably have a footnote that says, later manuscripts add the story of the adulterous woman. There was a question as to whether or not this story was a part of the original text of the Gospel of John. And many scholars do not believe it was for various reasons, including that some of the earliest manuscripts that we have of scriptures don't include this story. Now, now, lest your heart grow a little bit um, um, concerned right now, out of all of the text of scriptures that we've been preaching to you over the years, I don't believe I could fill up on one hand the times where we've had to mention something like this before. So, which means we have a reliable, sure testimony of God's word in your hands. There are only a few places in the text that may be in question, and this happens to be one of them. This week, in answering a congregant's question about this passage, as the congregant was reading ahead and noticed this, our own Pastor Green responded and said this, while many textual critics um, do not believe this passage, the, the, the adulterous woman passage is, is original, they've been unwilling to remove it probably for two reasons. One, it fits the context. If the episode created any kind of theological problem, it, it would have been taken out years ago. Number two, there's a long-standing history in the English for including it. And that is why all of our versions print it, and some, like the versions you have, make a comment about it not being in the earliest manuscripts. Also, commentator Leon Morris says this, if we cannot feel that this is part of John's gospel, I don't necessarily feel that way, but many do, we can feel that this story is true to the character of Jesus, and throughout the history of the church, it has been held that whoever wrote it this little story is authentic. It rings true and it speaks to our condition. It is thus worth our while to study it. So this morning I'm treating this passage as an accurate and true story about our Savior. Now, so moving on. So, if, well, if you have more questions about that than I can answer this morning, you're always welcome to email Pastor Green, okay? Email <laughs> Pastor Green. And uh, he, can, he can send you that quote again. So, <laughs> Now, friends, what is the shocking part of this story? It's certainly not that there's a woman in adultery. That's not shocking. We've already seen that in chapter 4. The shocking part of this story is the ugly, condemning actions of the Pharisees contrasted with the beautiful, masterful, merciful response of Jesus the superior self-righteous Pharisees who are themselves violating God's law with their actions are thrusting the sinner into the center of the, of the crowds for all to see her sin while blind to their own. And there's not one ounce of mercy in their being. Years of focus on me being better than you robs me of any mercy toward you. 
and in missing mercy, you will be remaining in cruel, cruel. This is cruel and ugly hypocrisy. This ugly picture invites us to examine our own hearts for just a moment. And folks, I, I'm asking you to examine your heart because if you look at this story and you say of the Pharisees, I can't believe they would do that. I wouldn't do that. What have you just done? You just placed your moral superiority over the blind Pharisees. And you are either confirming your blindness or slowly developing cataracts. That's not an attractive sight. C.S. Lewis says this, a cold self-righteous prig, boy, he did not mix any words there, who, who goes regularly to church, may be far nearer to hell than a prostitute. And we've seen that over and over. The woman at the well and now this woman. Folks, if you look at the problems plaguing our country, our churches, our families today, Cannot the intense division that we are experiencing today be attributed to self-righteous superiority? Whether on the right or the left, vaccine or no vaccine, mask, no mask, black lives matter or all lives matter, fund or defund the police, open or closed borders. Does the position you hold on these matters lift your soul up to say, therefore I am better than you? All that is happening in our society has been also happening in our churches. Many times, even this week, and when I feel like I stand here before you, I say something similar. I was on the phone with somebody and this was happening in their church once again. Now let's work, work backwards for just a moment. What area in your life do you constantly get irritated with another and you say in your mind, I can't believe he or she is doing that you might as well begin to put on the blinders. And as you go down that path, you will be one who will be remaining with a condemning accuser against you, and that is not a good thing. Let me explain what I mean by that. Notice what happens at the end of the story. Jesus is alone with the lady. That's what the text says. There are no more accusers. They all left, starting with the eldest. When you are alone with Jesus, there, with him, there is no condemnation. There is no more accuser. The Pharisees, equally culpable or greaterly culpable because they knew the law, they did not stay there with Jesus. Jesus did not say to them, I do not condemn you men. That means unless they come to Jesus sometimes, by themselves, they will stand condemned and have an accuser against them. Why is that? Folks, if you believe that you are morally superior to someone, you are focusing on a selective aspect of your own morality. And in, in comparison to another, you're only seeing a sliver of somebody else's morality. And if that's what you are relying on to make a judgment that you're better, one day when you stand before God in your own selective righteousness, he will accuse you of all that you missed about yourself and another. And he'll be right. And you will stand in your own righteousness, which is not. And there will be no choice but for you to be condemned. We will miss the mercy of Jesus if we don't come to him and be alone with him. And finally, as you miss the mercy of Jesus, you'll be one who will remain without joy. Let's say you're having a party. Who is on your top 10 list for, inviting to you, for invitations to your happy party? Would you want to invite the Pharisees? Would they be an upper for your party? <laughs> no. Or a woman like that is found here. Luke 7, 47 says of a similar woman. Who knows? It could be this one. I don't know. For this reason, I say to you, her sins, which are many, have been forgiven. For she loved much, but he who is forgiven little loves little. I want you to notice a small detail in the text, which Tim Keller pointed out. After all the crowds left and Jesus and the women, woman was alone, were alone, how on earth did we ever come to know about this story? 
if Jesus and the lady were alone? How did we know about what Jesus said to her? How was it that we ever came to hear about this story if they were alone? Who must have told it? Who, who, who told it? I, I can't prove this. Possibly the lady. The lady, after recognizing that the gospel was preached to her, you're guilty, but you're not condemned. <laughs> she accepted Jesus Christ and told this story. Most likely out of the overflowing joy of the forgiven woman here, similar to the one in John 4, the woman at the well, and uh, how the gospel spread throughout all of Samaria because of her. The overflow of her heart, telling people in her joy about Jesus, regardless of if it was her or not. A self-righteous person can never be joyful. The self-righteous soul will be on a never-ending journey of trying to inflate itself by finding some fault in another, and its only pleasure will be when it latches on to a fault in you so that I can be exalted against you. And that's a critical, judgmental spirit. There's never joy in that. Folks, do people look at you as a joyful person and are you? If not, could joy-robbing self-righteousness be plaguing you? The first blinding and deadly result of self-righteousness is that you will miss the mercy of Jesus Christ. Secondly, you're going to miss the light of Jesus Christ. Jesus, in our text today, masterfully exposes the Pharisees' hypocrisy. And light does that. Light exposes. You've never looked at yourself in the mirror in the dark and said, ooh, look at my hair. I got to do something with it. Because you never look at yourself in the dark. And even if you did, you couldn't see what's wrong with your hair. It's only when you turn on the light that you say, oh, man, I can't believe I look like that. And into this context, Jesus claims, I'm the light of the world. And the blind, self-righteous one in this text who have been exposed to a touch of the light of Jesus in our previous episode there are only left with two options now when Jesus claims to be the light of the world, saying, nah, -uh, you're, you're lying, your testimony is not true. And then, as self-righteous folks do, they must attempt to find fault in another. Jesus, who is your father? We've heard the rumors that you were born out of wedlock. So they go there. Our self-righteous self nature is akin to roaches scurrying around when the light turns on. Why is that? Well, we read earlier in John, John chapter 3, this is the judgment that the light has come into the world. And men love the darkness rather than the light, for their deeds were evil. Everyone who does evil hates the light and does not come to the light for fear that his deeds will be exposed. Folks, the temple illumination ceremony at the Feast of the Booze lit up the dark sky over Jerusalem. Past historians say it was like diamond lighting up Jerusalem then, exposing what was in the shadows of the night. And that's always the characteristic of light. However, what else do we know about light? Not only does light expose, but another way of saying this is light reveals. How do you know what something is unless you turn on the light and you're able to see and make a judgment? When you are stumbling around in the darkness and you hit your toe, you turn on the light and then you say, oh man, that's what I hit. I wish I'd turned on the light earlier. Light reveals and it illuminates so that I can navigate my way. And the point of the feast at which Jesus was revealing himself at that temple illumination was the symbolic glory cloud that led them through the dark times of the wilderness. And Jesus says precisely, I am that light that guided your ancestors. And without me, you will walk in darkness. You won't have guidance in life. You cannot function. You'll be hitting everything in this life. Let me ask you another question about light. This is interesting and the answer is obvious. But what is the evidence that light is present? Okay, so we got lights up here. What is the evidence that light is actually present? Okay, 
so hang on to that. Those of you in the science background know about the curious phenomenon called light. Is it a wave? Is it a particle? Is it material in nature that I can hold it with my hands? That'd be cool if I could. I could make a lightsaber. I could do something like that. <laughs> our scientific knowledge of the phenomenon of light is relatively shallow, even in our modern age. So what is the evidence that light is present? It shines. And if you can't see it, you're blind. Jesus, is, Jesus was shining in his mercy, shining in his righteous character, shining in his teaching, shining in his signs. And for the self-righteous whose actions they believe were better than others, whose speech is superior to others, whose belief that they are better than others, they could only see their own light, which is no light at all, blinding them to the light of Jesus. Thus the perpetual blinding self-righteousness who do not see Jesus also don't know God. The light of God, the Father, is precisely the same as the light of the world, Jesus. Denying him is denying the Father. Any so-called religious claims that claims to know God but does not recognize the shining one, Jesus, is totally false. So faith friends, today I'm asking you, um, if we're involved, not asking, I'm pointing out to you, the self-righteous will miss the mercy of Jesus. The self-righteous will miss the light of Jesus, which is the light of God the Father. And finally, the third blinding and deadly result of self-righteousness is that, oh my goodness, you're going to miss the life of Jesus. Again, our theme this year is enjoying life in his name. And we are seeing a clear way that we will miss that is through blinding self-righteousness. If I'm blind to my own faults, then I will not admit that I need a savior. For why do I need a savior? If I don't believe I have faults, Charles Spurgeon said, the greatest enemy to human souls is the self-righteous spirit, which makes men look to themselves for salvation. And three times in our text today, three times, as if Jesus is pleading with us, you will perish in your sins. Do you understand that you have sins? You believe you're self-righteous, but you're going to, he says it three times. But the hope in all of this is our passage ends today with Jesus promising one last shining sign that is illuminating if we have eyes to see. The last sign that Jesus will promise, the last sign will be when the light of the world is enveloped in our self-righteous darkness. Let me explain what I mean by that. The last sign, greater than any of the miracles that we have seen up to this point, the last sign will be putting on full display the only power that can penetrate self-righteousness, and that is the cross. John 8, Jesus said to these blind folks, okay, this is heading toward an end. You're going to kill me. And when you lift up the son of man, you will know that I am. This is what all of John's gospel is building toward. The time at which his hour arrives, the moment at which, and hear my words on this, he is, this word is chosen carefully, strategically, the moment at which he is glorified, the moment at which he is lit up like a thousand spotlights on him. Throughout the book of John, John will consistently use the phrase, the moment of my glorification has come. For example, in John 17, Jesus spoke these things and lifting up his eyes to heaven, he said, Father, the hour has come, light me up. <laughs> but this is, a, this is a, one of the biggest ironies in scripture. Glory normally means light, brilliance. But in this case, Jesus is lifted up and it's not brilliant 
light, but in the darkness of death. And we know from other gospels that during what would have been the lightest part of the day during Jesus' crucifixion, from noon until three or whatever o'clock it was, that the earth was dark. The sun somehow was blocked from giving its light. Why? Because the light of the world was enveloped in the darkness of death. In the line of a song that we sing, the moon and stars, they wept. The morning sun, the morning sun, S-U-N, was dead. The savior of the world has fallen. Do you get it? The final light out there to help open our blinded self-righteous eyes is actually not light at all, but darkness. So deep of darkness that the light of the world had to be momentarily extinguished. Here's the implication of that. The depths of our darkness was so deep that it required the slaughter of the light of the world, consuming him. What does that do for our self-righteousness that we believe that we might have an ounce of? Jesus in his love was willing to take on your darkness to be extinguished. He was willing to take on your blindness, your sentence of death, so that you would not have to perish. God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whoever believes in him should not perish so that you could be children of light. And friends, when we come to the cross with eyes to see its meaning, whether the first time when acknowledging the depths of our sin, the first time, or as a believer continuing to walk with Christ, not in self-righteousness because now we're believers and we're better than anybody else, but coming to Christ um, daily at the cross as a believer is the final nail in the coffin of self-righteousness. Why is that? Listen carefully to this insight from Milton Vincent in the Gospel Primer. I can't say it better than he has. He says this, the cross also exposes me before the eyes of other people. Notice the terminology exposes light, even though the cross was an instrument of darkness and death. But the cross exposes me before the eyes of other people, informing them of the depths of my depravity. You understand when you go to the cross, you're saying, that's what I deserve. <laughs> that's what it took. The extinguishing of the light of the world because of the depths of the darkness of my sin, no ounce of self-righteousness in me. If I wanted others to think highly of me, I would conceal the fact that a shameful slaughter of the perfect son of God was required for, for me. But when I stand at the foot of the cross and am seen by others under, under that light, I am left uncomfortably exposed before their eyes. Indeed, the most humiliating gossip that could ever be whispered about me is actually being shouted from Golgotha's heel. And my self-righteousness reputation is left in ruins in the wake of the cross. With the worst facts known about me, that's what it took to cover my sins. I find myself truly saying that there's nothing else I have left to hide before you. I have no righteousness of my own. That's what it took for me. Believer, the moment you acknowledge the depth of your sin at the cross is the moment that you blare from Golgotha's hill that the depths of my darkness required extinguishing the light of the world on the cross for me. So Christians, why would we ever, ever be known for operating on I'm better than you in some fashion? I'm better than my spouse. I'm better than my children. I'm better than my neighbor. I'm better than the political right or the political left. Why would that be known of us? Your profession of being a Christian at the foot of the cross is completely opposite of you being better than anybody. And for us as Christ's disciples, we're supposed to be known for our love, not some kind of condemning self-righteous attitude that we might manifest at some points. 
For the unbelievers here today, every so-called religion out there in the world is based upon the damning doctrine of self-righteousness. Every one. There is not a one of the world's religion that doesn't say that you earn your salvation by doing these certain things so that you can be getting in good with God or impress others with your morality. And the only one that is an exception is biblical, rightly understood, gospel-centered Christianity that relies on the righteousness of another. If you're here today and you don't know that light of the world, will you turn from your blinding self-righteousness and see the light of the world in front of you and his being lit up on the cross? And folks, when we realize what was required for the depths of our darkness and what the light of the world did for me, how can we not now proclaim this light from the rafters and serve him wholeheartedly, including seriously considering giving that light to the children. Let's get those 94 um, opportunities there in children's ministries buttoned up if we can, even this day. Let me conclude with a hymn from James Proctor in his, in his hymn called It Is Finished. He says this, Weary, working, burdened one, wherefore, wherefore toil you so? Cease your doing all was done long, long ago. Tell to Jesus, uh, work you clean by a simple faith. Doing is a deadly thing. Doing ends in death. Cast your deadly doing down, down at Jesus' feet. Stand in him, in him alone, gloriously complete. Standing in Jesus' righteousness alone, we receive mercy without missing it. We're illuminated by the lights of the world. We don't remain in darkness. And we receive his eternal life. And we're raised from the dead. Let's pray. Father God, we thank you for making it so clear. You have not left us without evidence, testimony, light in this world. And Father, we know that our own self-righteous hearts, which all of us manifest is that which blinds us from the righteousness of Christ. Father, will you penetrate our darkness by the love and light of Jesus' glorification on the cross? We pray these things in Christ's name, his name. Amen.